Jesus Listens, the 365-day prayer devotional, now comes in a note-taking edition. This beautiful book includes a leather soft cover and space each day for you to write your reflections, prayers, and thoughts. It makes a perfect gift for anyone who journals and wants to make a record of their walk with God. Look for the Jesus Listens note-taking edition wherever you buy books. We realized in counseling that our differences didn't have to divide us. Our differences could actually make us better and complete our marriage as one whole marriage. And we started to learn that the goal of our marriage was not to think alike, it was to think together. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. When we think about our problems, it can sometimes look like things are only happening to us. Our struggles may appear one-sided and that God has left us to deal with it on our own. But when we draw near to God, He plants people in our lives to show us that our pain is not meant to be carried alone. And when He does that, we have a comforting reminder of a God who will never leave us or forsake us. Pastors Jimmy and Irene Rollins have a passion to reach all people for God, no matter their background, ethnicity, or life circumstances. As they dreamed of building a diverse congregation, the stress of being leaders of a growing church began to negatively impact them both and Irene took to coping with alcohol. They share how together they faced her addiction and the problems that made it come to a head. Author of Confronting Christianity, Rebecca McLaughlin, shares why it's important to encourage young people to dig into the Word of God. She believes that reading the Bible with her children and helping them work through their questions helps them make sense of their faith, and also teaches them a way to live that is steeped in compassion for others. Let's start with Jimmy and Irene Rollins' story. Well, my name is Irene Rollins, and I am a pastor. I'm an author. I'm also a recovery activist, and I lead a ministry for marriages called Two Equals One with my husband. My name is Jimmy Rollins, and I pastored as a senior pastor, and we led a church since 2011, and also an author and a speaker that travels and really is trying to spread the good news of the gospel. I grew up in my parents' church and just did everything in ministry and got a taste of every area of ministry. Ended up being the student pastor for about 10 years and then transitioned to like the executive pastor role at my parents' church. And then in 2011, my wife and I relaunched it to I-5 City. It was predominantly an African-American church, and our goal was diversity. We felt like God calling us to, you know, birthing and starting a diverse church. And so we began to change a predominantly African-American church to just loving and accepting and having in the congregation all sorts of ages, all sorts of ethnic backgrounds, and really embrace men and women in ministry. We felt like God put on our hearts that if we were going to reach a diverse city, we were going to have to have a diverse church. I've always just begun to notice the ostracized, the outcast, the overlooked, and wanting to you know, have the heart of God and to love people like Jesus loves people. As a pastor and a mother and a wife, I was serving God, loving God, loving His people, really running a church with my husband. And everything we did was about making sure we fulfilled the mission of the Great Commission. And as we were doing that and leading our church about three years in, I introduced alcohol back into my life after having hadn't drank for maybe 10 plus years. And upon doing so, I quickly, unknowingly slid into the grips of addiction. It kind of crept up on me. I didn't even see it coming because I didn't know anything about addiction and I didn't realize that my undealt with trauma, unhealthy coping mechanisms for stress and pain and my really dysfunctional marriage. At the time, we had no idea that our dysfunction was dysfunction. It was just our normal. And as the pain, as the stress and pressure of ministry as we led and served God began to pile up, I began to use alcohol as a coping mechanism. 
When I began to address it with my husband, we would argue a lot. And we experienced a lot of pain because I began to hide alcohol. And as our marriage began to get more dysfunctional, I began to hide in the shame of the fact that I was drinking to blackout. Jimmy gave me an ultimatum to get help and go to rehab, or he was really going to leave the marriage. And when I did finally face the fact that I had a problem, I ended up in rehab, and that rock bottom was the most painful, shame-filled experience that I thought I wasn't gonna make it out of. At the time, I think I was actually driving her further into the addiction, you know, with my judgment, with my unbridled way of trying to get her to stop drinking with my own anger issues, my own vices. When I ended up in rehab, I thought that I couldn't face the fact that someone would one day find out that I was a pastor and a wife and ended up in rehab. But once I got to rehab, I realized that there were doctors, lawyers, stay-at-home moms, like addiction was not a respecter of persons. We got accountability that helped us get to the space of needing to get healthy and to get help. And then as we began to get healthy, we stopped doing the dance of shaming one another and judging one another. And we started to embrace, you know, the fact that we both needed grace. And as we begin to do that, we begin to heal and we begin to get the tools necessary to really care for one another's journey in the healing process. We worked together in terms of admitting our weaknesses. It was realizing everything that we were not. All our broken places of trauma, all our past family of origin dysfunction and things we brought into the marriage, we began to work on those things. We began to look at addiction as not something that I was doing to Jimmy, but rather something I was doing to really medicate pain. And as we began to develop new ways of communication, new ways of embracing pain and grief, we began to approach healing and we did it together. I began to realize that the more I admitted my weaknesses to God and to my husband and to others in group settings, such as AA or Celebrate Recovery or small groups in my church, I began to realize the power of reframing shame as I spoke it. Connecting with God on a daily basis, a moment-by-moment basis, was a lifeline for me in the beginning of my recovery. And as a leader, as a mother, as a child of God, it is my lifeline still. It was a non-negotiable and still is in my recovery journey. I connect with the Lord first thing in the morning, learning to really bring Him into my Every day, every moment required me having some disciplines like devotions first thing in the morning. My Jesus Calling devotion was and still is a huge part of my life. But those first three years in my recovery journey, it really helped me to slow down long enough to stop and really breathe and think and reflect and surrender my will to the Lord's will and really walk out what it really means to be intimate with my father. And all of the blockages that I had in my relationship with God prior to my recovery journey, really when I began to get more aware of his presence in my moments with him, awareness of his presence, my weaknesses, my humanity, my need for him, all of that came through my time of meditation and devotions. I'm seven years sober to date. So now when I say that I'm a recovering alcoholic, I'm actually grateful about it. And I'm really overcoming shame every time I admit my weakness of addiction to alcohol. I am not looking at alcoholism as I am bad. I'm looking at it as I can never drink again. It's a weakness because I've altered my brain chemistry. And out of that, God can Romans 8, 28, use it for good to help set others free. And that's exactly what he's done. And I'll spend the rest of my life boasting about what the Lord has done in me, in my family, in my marriage.
really people are shocked at times when we begin to share our story of recovery and things that we've overcome and we get vulnerable and transparent about our story and how the Lord had really came in and rescued us, how he was with us in the the, the pain of the injuries and the traumas and the dysfunction, but he was also with us in our healing. And I think that really for us, when we share that, it gives people permission to share and pursue healing for themselves. It gives them hope. It awakens the desire to get well and get free and then share it with the world. And a person struggling with my PTSD and struggling with addiction, what I am passionate about is really making a statement by sharing my story of recovery and removing the shame and giving people permission to say, I need help. What we've discovered is that pain is a unifier. Divorce has no color. Alcoholism has no socioeconomic temperature. Grief is colorblind. And what we've discovered is is that as we begin to stay transparent with our story, as we begin to steward the path of where we are to this greater purpose, pain has been the unifier in the receptivity of the message of diversity and unity, the reconciliation that needs to happen racially in our country and in our world. You know, what we've discovered is, is we've never changed a mind. We've never changed a heart. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. We like to say you don't have to have shared experience to share empathy. Because diversity is in not just race, not just gender and socioeconomic status. It is broken people. Really, all of our brokenness is different. It's diverse. And so as we come together in God's church and share our stories and empathize with one another and feel each other's pain, experience it together and allow God to come in and bring healing. I really believe that we experience the power of unity. And one thing I like to share with my family and those around me and just as a pastor is, you know, connecting with God is more than prayer. It's seeing him in our every day, in those we meet, in nature, connecting with him in things like that. And it took me getting into recovery to slow down long enough to appreciate those things. I have this really this rule of life now that I'm going to be before I do. I'm going to be with God before I do anything for God. I'm going to give out of my healed self, out of my time with him. I can't give away what I don't have. If my goal is to give away the love of Christ, I've got to sit and really receive his love myself. And it requires slowing down and being with him in order to do that. Irene speaks a prayer from Jesus Listens, March 24th, to wrap up their time with us. Mighty God, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. So I won't let problems intimidate me. Instead, I'll remember that you, the Mighty One, are in my midst, and you are greater than all the trouble in the world. The Bible assures me that your right hand will save me if I cling tightly to your hand. I can walk confidently through my toughest times. Please keep reminding me that I'm not alone in my struggles. You are with me, and my brothers throughout the world are experiencing the same kind of sufferings. As I go along this challenging path, I need to stay in connection and communication with you. Your living presence revives me, strengthening me and blessing me with peace. To learn more about Jimmy and Irene Rollins, visit twoequalsone.com. And be sure to check out their latest books, Love Outside the Lines and Reframe Your Shame at your favorite retailer. Stay tuned to Rebecca McLaughlin's story, after a brief message. Jesus Listens is the new prayer devotional book from Sarah Young that has been helping people everywhere deepen their relationship to God through prayer. 
Now, you can hear these daily prayers with the brand new Jesus Listens audiobook. The Jesus Listens audiobook contains daily, short, heartfelt prayers and is the perfect way to connect with God on a daily basis that fits your busy schedule. You can listen from anywhere, during a morning commute, an afternoon walk, or as part of your regular meditation and reflection time. Two versions of the Jesus Listens audiobook are available for your listening pleasure. You can select the audiobook narrated by Nan Gurley. March 18th. Dear Jesus, how wonderful it is to know that you are taking care of me. Or you can choose the version of the audiobook narrated by Bill Russell. March 4th. Dear Jesus, I know that you are with me, so please help me not to be afraid. Check out the Jesus Listens audiobook on Audible, Apple Books, or wherever you listen to audiobooks. Our next guest is Rebecca McLaughlin, author of Confronting Christianity, 12 Hard Questions for the World's Largest Religion, and 10 Questions Every Teen Should Ask and Answer About Christianity. Rebecca shares how she built the roadmap to answer some pretty challenging questions about race, diversity, and other topics that young Christians often grapple with. She opens up about how talking to our children early on prepares them to seek Jesus more. My name is Rebecca McLaughlin. I come from the UK. I was born and raised in England, lived most of my childhood and adolescence and teenage years in London. As far back as I can remember, I've always been a follower of Jesus, but probably from the time I was about nine, I have distinct memories of knowing that Jesus was the only person I could truly rely on. And from that stage in my Christian life as well, I was surrounded by friends who were very intelligent, often very well-meaning people who didn't believe in Jesus at all. So from an early age as a Christian, I was wanting to explain to my friends why I found Jesus so compelling and why some of the reasons they had for not even considering Christianity, whether they were intellectual reasons or, or ethical reasons, why those reasons didn't actually stand up when you looked at them more closely. I went to Cambridge University and did my undergrad, master's and PhD in English literature. And then I went to seminary for three years in order to study the Bible more and to be trained to have conversations about Jesus better. It seemed like Jesus provided the most satisfying way of looking at the world, the most satisfying way of understanding my relationships, my intellectual life, my personal life. and. I just never looked back from that point. When I was coming out of seminary in the UK and had just married a guy from Oklahoma who really wanted to move back to the US, we were talking together about what I would do in America. And honestly, it was hard for me, the thought of leaving a relatively gospel-poor country like the UK to move to a relatively gospel-rich country like the United States. I spent nine years working with a ministry called the Veritas Forum, and much of my role there was connecting with Christian professors at at leading secular universities, places like Harvard and Yale and Oxford and Cambridge, who were also serious followers of Jesus, and helping them to think about how they could speak about their faith in relation to their work in the university context. And I had the opportunity to hear from them, you know, why it was that they found Jesus so compelling. If some of them had been raised in Christian families and had continued in their faith, others had actually become Christians later on in their lives. And after nine years of doing that, meeting with these professors, hearing their stories of faith, how they they reflected on their research as Christians, I felt like I had a little bit of a roadmap of, of where many of the conversations are when it comes to everything from science and faith to faith and philosophy to psychology to history. And I wanted to make those conversations, those insights, those stories available to a larger audience. I truly love to write, so I I feel incredibly thankful that the writing that I do that's profoundly helpful to me (laughs) turns out to often be helpful to other people as well. I wrote Confronting Christianity 
almost as a love letter to my non-Christian friends. So I, I wrote it primarily to people who are adult and pretty educated and might have some really substantial objections to Christianity for a range of reasons. After that, I was reflecting on the fact that younger Christians and younger people who may have dismissed Christianity for whatever reason as well are actually facing almost all the same kinds of challenges. My kids currently are 12, 10, and 4. Even a, a few years ago when I was writing 10 Questions Every Teen Should Ask, were encountering it, all the same kinds of challenges to faith that university students and, and folks beyond that were encountering as well. And so I, I wrote the junior version of Confronting Christianity to help kids, you know, whether they, they're teens or, or not even quite yet teens, see that every seeming roadblock to faith in Jesus, when you look more closely, becomes a signpost. You know, there are a lot of people who think that, that Christianity is kind of against diversity, against love across racial difference, against equality and against justice. But actually, if you look at the scriptures and if you look at history writ large, you'll find that Christianity is the basis for those things. Much of what our young people in particular are craving and longing for and what their hearts desire, that the world around us tells them, well, you have to leave Christianity to find true justice, true diversity, true flourishing, true love. Actually, you have to dig into Christianity to find those things. I think a lot of Christian parents have the concern or the sense that a big piece of their job is kind of protecting their children from difficult ideas, whether it's questions, you know, around suffering that, that might be disturbing to their kids. And I think there are a lot of Christian parents who think, well, I don't really want to talk to my children until I, I have to. You know, maybe it's when they're 14 or 15. If we take that approach, all we are doing is letting other people have those conversations while we're not. <laughs> and if I want to read the Bible with my children, which I do, I actually need to be willing to talk to them about some really hard things really early on. So I'm not hoping to push off those conversations to the very last minute. I'm trying to have those conversations early and often because they're one of the ways that I'm pointing my kids to Jesus. The more that I read the Bible for myself, the more I become amazed and intrigued by what it's saying and the more I realize how little I know. The more that I dig into any topic of relevance to faith, the more convinced of Jesus I become. Now that's been true when I've looked at science and it's been true when I've looked at scripture. I spent some time last year in particular writing and as part of that, I was looking at, you know, how do we relate to the, the four gospel accounts of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as historical documents? What does it mean to say that they are giving us access to eyewitness testimony about Jesus? And the more I dug into that, the more fascinated and compelled I became, actually. The, the more I realized the gospel authors had massive amounts of eyewitness testimony to draw from, and they had to boil it down to really, really short books that can be read in the same time that it takes to watch a, a film, like a movie. And doing that more in-depth work, that kind of digging around in the Gospels, really just made me more excited about Jesus. Even as I sit down to read through one of the Gospels, I'm always amazed by all the things that I've missed. And in daily Bible reading and prayer, that just helps me once more to lift my eyes to Jesus and to get a glimpse of what he's doing in this world. Rebecca closes our episode with a prayer from Jesus Listens, May 26th. King Jesus, the light of the gospel of your glory is an astonishingly rich treasure. What makes the gospel such amazingly good news is that it opens the way for me to know you in your majestic glory. When I trusted you as my saviour, you set my feet on a pathway to heaven. Forgiveness of sins and a future in heaven are wondrous gifts, but you provided even more. You made your light shine in my heart to give me the light of the knowledge of the glory of your face. Help me to seek your face wholeheartedly, delighting in the radiant knowledge of your glorious presence. In your wonderful name. 
Amen. To learn more about Rebecca, visit RebeccaMcLaughlin.org and find her new book, Exploring the Earliest Gospel, a Kids Bible Study on Jesus and His Good News, wherever books are sold. If you'd like to hear more stories about celebrating our individuality, check out our interview with Deb Liu. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we'll hear from pitcher Luke Weaver, who dreams of living his faith out loud from the mound, and how he's striving to keep a what-would-Jesus-do mindset when approaching any obstacle. We're vulnerable. We're seeking counsel. We're seeking some type of comfort in some type of way. And the easiest answer for me has just always been the Word and prayer and really pushing to make that a priority because... I've had my moments where I've tried to do it myself, and it's just the most brutal plan. It's sloppy, and it's just, it's not built on any type of firm foundation. Want to hear more inspirational stories of people who have been changed by a closer walk with God? Then subscribe today to the Jesus Calling Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please be sure to leave a review, which helps us reach and inspire others with these stories. Plus, if you like seeing our guests as well as hearing them, you can find video interviews available on our YouTube channel at youtube.com Jesus Calling Book on Facebook and on the Jesus Calling Instagram page.